And we're just going to get to one chapter tonight, Mike. Just one chapter, and that's all you get. That's all you get. Chapter 38. Go ahead and turn over there. Chapter 38. Just before Hezekiah is going to face Sennacherib, of course, if you've been with us, those Assyrians, oh my, what a powerful army are they. They have squashed everybody. They have rolled over the northern ten tribes region uh, without hardly any significant resistance whatsoever. And now they're pointed at Jerusalem. And the king, Hezekiah, He's all, a couple hundred thousand soldiers are on their way to camp around, lay siege to the city of Jerusalem. What do I do? What do I do? Well, you know that Isaiah, the prophet, basically says, King Hezekiah, chill. It's going to be okay. Now, fascinating. There's a bit of a parenthetical section here in chapter 38. Let's check it out. Just before Hezekiah is going to face Sennacherib, chapter 38, verse 1. In those days, right, 701 B.C. That's going to be kind of important. In those days, 701 B.C., Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Okay, you know. You ever open up to that one on one of your devotionals? Let's see what God has for me today. And Judas went out and hanged himself. Oh, let's turn the page. What are you going to do when God's word says, you have accomplished everything that I've asked you to do. You have fulfilled the design that I designed you from the foundation of the world. You did well. It's time to go home. Now, I get it if you're like, well, there's more things I want to do. Um, Jesus said it the best on the night that he was going to be betrayed there in the garden. Oh, the cross, you know, all that sin laid upon me, the presence of the Father broken. We've never been apart, you know. Any sweat, as it were, great drops of blood of the Lord. Is the cross the only way? What's the answer? Yeah. And then there's Jesus, fully man and fully God. And he says, okay, not my will, but thine be done. That's a very important concept when we come to the things of God. Hezekiah, here comes the word of God in the form of Isaiah. Okay, Hezi, nice job. You did well. Time to go home to be with God. If Hezekiah would have said, well, I don't know if I, I'm a big fan of that particular ministry model, but, you know, God is smarter than me. Not my will, but thine be done. Then it would have been all over, but that's not what Hezekiah does. Verse 2. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall, <laughs> and he began to weep and cry, and prayed to the Lord, verse 3, and said, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and and with a loyal heart. Hezekiah is operating under the uh, mistaken notion that God loves to bless us because we do well. God moves through us because we've been performing adequately. Harvest, why does God love you and why does God give us anything and bless us? What's the answer? Because you're his kids and he loves you. Hezekiah is basically trying to show God his resume. But look at all that I've done. Do we ever earn God's blessing? Nope. He just blesses us. You grandmas and grandpas know exactly about that one. Why are you spending so much money on those grandkids? Uh, Because it's awesome. Right, Papa Sal? Remember how, remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart. You know, you remember that one, right? And have done what is good in your sight? And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Pretty powerful Hebrew word there. He was, oh, he was, what's the, the, the ugly kind of cry? The, the, the boogers kind of cry. That's what kind he was. When I am not sort of of the mindset, not my will but thine, I want you to see what can happen. Um, you guys have heard the concept that there might be the perfect will of God and then there's kind of the permissive will of God. 
I, I like the concept. I don't know that I can make an adequate case for it. But some people point to this verse. Well, here you go. God's perfect will was for Hezekiah to come home. But he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And so God's permissive will, well, okay, okay. Perhaps, but keep an eye toward this notion. Not my will, Lord, but yours. You have all the facts and all the wisdom and I don't. I have a ton of emotions about a number of things. But when it really comes down to it, will I lay my stuff down because it serves his glory. Well, Hezekiah has this sort of option here. And the Lord is basically going to say, all right. He's going to give Hezekiah 15 more years. We, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 God is good. Is whoopee, God is good, is that what we are when we're not getting what we want? Hezekiah here, um, I, I tend to sort of look down my nose at some of these things until the Lord reminds me, uh, hello, uh, Steve, this is you sometimes. What? Did you know that in the next 15 years, Hezekiah is going to have a son and that son is named Manasseh. And Manasseh is the worst, most evil king that the southern two tribes region has ever known. The high water mark for low character in the northern 10 tribes region, that's probably going to go to King Ahab, who was married to Jezebel. In the south, you know who gets the trophy for the worst of the worst? Manasseh does. For the next 57 years, when Manasseh is the king, he stops everybody from reading their Bible. In fact, the Bible itself becomes quite scarce. He begins to incorporate idol worship all over the city, and he even brings in booths, little worship booths, to Baal and Ashtaroth and all that. Read that. Prostitution. He brings those little sort of uh, get-togethers inside the temple proper. Oh, my. Because of his awful wickedness, God is going to say, now I must, it's my responsibility. Love's responsibility, a part of that is judgment. It's my responsibility to stand up for what I said all the way back to Moses in Deuteronomy 28. There's so much sin in this place, I'm going to have to judge. That's what Manasseh does. Had Hezekiah not lived those 15 years, there would not have been Manasseh. And I wrote in my margin, hey, Steve, be careful when I pray past God stop signs. How many of you guys know that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord? We. Uh, what about the stops of God? A binging, ow, I ran right into a stop sign of the Lord. Ah, Lord, you know this is not convenient for me. Let me tell you, let me give you the resume of all the reasons why you should bless me. Then we're pulling off a Hezekiah here. And be careful when you are praying past God's stop signs. Please, God, no. <clears throat> please, God, no. Please, God, no. Please, 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 no, no, no. Please, God. God just might say what? All right. Here it comes. <laughs> Verse four. And the word of the Lord came to Isaiah saying, Go and tell Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer and I have seen your tears. Surely I will add your days 15 years and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the, of the king of Assyria. That's Sennacherib. And I will defend the city, verse seven. And this is the sign to you from God from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing which he has spoken. Behold, come check it out. I will bring the shadow on the sundial which has gone down with the sun on the sundial of Ahaz. Archaeology thinks this particular sundial may not be the classic circular sundial where the sun's shadow moves across a kind of a clock face, although it could have been. A lot of scholars think that it was actually a, a specially made staircase that there was a shadow that effectively did the same thing. But here's the point. Um, 
Is the sun moving across the sky? Well, it sure looks like that, but we know better. Our cosmology is way more modern. Is the sun moving or is it the earth? It's the earth spinning. The earth is a great, big, huge mass. It's a sphere spinning in the emptiness of space, or I should say the lack of environment of space. And because it is a gyroscope, if you know much about gyroscopes, once you get one spinning, there's a number of things that will happen. How many of you ever had a top where you go, zing, it's spinning like this, and then the axis of the top, it doesn't topple over? Oh, that's a gyroscope. It is very difficult to stop a gyroscope of significant mass that is spinning without any resistance of atmosphere or gravity. There's our huge planet, 8,000 mile diameter. I don't know what the mass of the Earth is, but it's a, it's a big old planet. And it's spinning in space relative to the surface of the Earth. The sun more or less seems to be in a fixed location. Now, we know that even our solar system is a part of the Milky Way galaxy, but let's keep our microscope sort of focused in on this Earth spinning. The sundial is a result of the sun's angle shining across, forming a shadow. Is the shadow moving or is the sun moving? Or relative to the surface of the earth, the sun is. If you're going to stop the progression of the sun and even move it backwards, that, of course, is quite impossible. Um, I'm a devotee of God's word, and Bible prophecy is one of the most stunning examples that our Bible does not come from humans. It's, it's, uh, come, it originates from outside of our time-space continuum. But if you're a thinking, reasonable person, you read the story here. Uh, let me show you another one. Did, has that ever happened before? Hold your finger here. Uh, join me in the book of Joshua. Book of Joshua in your Old Testament. You know that the sun stood still for Joshua too. Are you in Joshua? Look at Joshua chapter 10. How is this even possible? Causing many to doubt. Everybody knows the sun is not moving, the earth is. Seriously, God stopped the rotation of the planet? Did you know if there was a signpost that was off the surface of the earth in the stationary position, and we are flinging by, and if we're at the equator, do you know that the equator of the earth is spinning some one, or pardon me, 11,000 miles per hour? If you could have a signpost hanging in space, when you're on the equator, here you are, whoosh, that thing, that signpost, would fly past at 11,000 miles per hour. Whoosh, that's how fast we're going. Now, if the sun, if the earth is going to stop, whoosh, you would be hurled across the surface of the earth at about 11,000 miles per hour, a tumble until you stopped. I don't think that the earth stopped. Well then, uh, Mr. Smart Guy, what do you think happened? Are you in Joshua chapter 10? Look down at verse number 10. There are five kings that have come against Israel, and there's our Joshua, and God has promised Joshua a tremendous victory. Verse 10, Joshua, uh, verse 10. So the Lord routed them before Israel, and he killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon. And he chased them along the road that goes to Beth Horon and struck them down as far as Azekah to Makeda. Uh, if you've been reading the initial attack, Israel does prevail. But Joshua, proving to be a very capable uh, general, he says, we got to go get them all. We have to finish them off. Verse 11. And it happened as they fled before Israel and were on the descent to Beth Horon that the Lord cast down large hailstones. Now, are these hailstones like that form in a cloud? They could be. But let's keep reading. Large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and then they died. And more were killed or more died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killing them with the sword. Here is another highly unusual atmospheric phenomenon. Um, I want you to notice that if you cruise through the scripture, you're going to see a number of very profound, some would say supernatural um, upheavals on the earth. Now, 
please remember that we are sort of in that, that idea that everything is moving today as it always has. Um, uniformitarianism is the name of it. We'll see the processes of earth that we see today. That's how it's always been. Now, please remember, I don't think so. Uh, there was that flood thing. You might be familiar with that. There was a number of times when God did something quite extraordinary. So uniformitarianism, um, you might want to put that one on the shelf. I want to go back to the story in Joshua. It's a highly unusual atmospheric phenomenon. Sodom and Gomorrah. Did they have a very interesting series of phenomenon? Fire and brimstone, and again, these amazing hailstones. Um, when Egypt, uh, some of the ten plagues of Egypt, uh, were those extraordinary atmospheric phenomena, and even then, there are hailstones there is true, uh, there as well. Oh, by the way, um, just for you Bible students, what was the penalty for blaspheming the holy God? It's in there in Leviticus 24. It was death by stoning. Interesting. What about the stones that are on the ground, like igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary? Could be those. But what if they're coming from outer space? What are you talking about? Um, meteors are constantly burning up in our atmosphere. We, we live in a rough neighborhood, if you didn't know that. Uh, if you've ever seen the moon through a, a good set of binoculars, the moon has really had it. It's been hammered a lot, big time. Um, we have an atmosphere as well as an ionosphere and then also a magnetic field that defers and, and deflects away um, a lot of cosmic radiation but even very large, the uh, size of a bus, the size of an automobile, even larger, more often than not, a meteor will hit the earth at such a speed that the friction against the atmosphere will burn it up. A meteorite is usually a metal, uh, like an iron or some of the metals, ferrite and some of the stuff that comes in from space. There's something else, a little trick that the cosmos has for us. It's called a bolide. You know what a bolide is? A bolide is perhaps maybe it's a, it's a comet of some kind, but they're pieces of not sort of homogeneous, uh, consistent metals. They are a mixture, very oftentimes, of different metals and sometimes ice. When they hit the super, super, supersonic uh, friction of the earth, they will tend to explode um, you might have heard of one that happened in the Siberian wilderness around the turn of the 1900s. Uh, tusk, tusk, tusk. I can't think of what it's called. Uh, but it exploded in the Siberian. You can buy some of the, the water from that region. Tusk. I'm not getting anything from this crowd. <laughs> Toscano? It's not Toscano. What is it? Tuscany. Tuscany? No, Tuscany, though, is a nice tile, however. Oh, I'll think of it after the thing. But the point of it is, 19, what was it, 02, 03, somewhere in that area, something went flying through the atmosphere and everybody saw it and they wrote it down. But it exploded with such force that it flattened trees for hundreds of miles. And um, it exploded with uh, the force of a very large nuclear device. What was that? That was a bolide. Tunguska, you probably have your phone out, don't you, right there? <laughs> Tunguska, for the tape, Michael, it's Tunguska. There you go. Well, things are hitting the planet all the time, but if you don't have an atmosphere like the moon, it's pocked with all kinds of, of uh, relics. Um, there is something fascinating that if you get them out and you do the math on them, some interesting things happen. For instance, did you know that before 701 B.C., all of the calendars, everybody say all, all of the calendars, Chaldeans, Egyptians, Hebrews, Greeks, Phoenicians, Chinese, Mayan, Hindus, Carthaginians, Etruscans, the Teutons, and everybody who lived in Fernley, all had a 360-day calendar. Did you know that? 
Something happened in 701 BC. Everybody had to remake their calendar. Even Hezekiah, after this thing happened with the sundial, suddenly the earth was not behaving in a typical yearly fashion. Rome added five days. Hezekiah then said, you know what we have to do? Every three to six years, let's throw in a whole new month called Adar II. The Romans, they added five days. Hezekiah adds a month to the Jewish year. Why? There were some people who got to noticing as archaeology unearthed more and more information and we were beginning to date many of the occurrences of the scriptures with more and more focus and specificity. They begin to notice something quite remarkable. The Bible catalogs huge catastrophic events occurring at intervals of about 108 years. What do you mean? What are you talking about? The days of Peleg, if you know that story, 2146 BC. The Tower of Babel destroyed, uh, 1930 BC. Sodom and Gomorrah, remember the weird stuff that was happening there? 1877 BC. Some of the catastrophes in Job, remember when he lost all of his stuff? That happened in 1663. The plagues of Moses and the Exodus. We know that's 1447 B.C. The long day of Joshua that we just read. That's 1404 B.C. The battle of Beth Horon and the Amorites. Supernatural events that happened for Deborah. Do your research. 1108 B.C. Some of the miracles documented by 1 and 2 Samuel. 188 B.C. Two different catastrophes during the reign of David. Elijah, the, some of the atmospheric things that happened there. One happened in 864 B.C. Massive earthquake is mentioned by Joel and Amos. Come to find out, that was two years before the earthquake, they said. You do the math. Excavations at Hazor placed that quake in October of 756 B.C. And now here we are, 701 B.C. seems to be the last of the cycles. These 108 year sequences of catastrophes did not go unnoticed along with, did you know that most of our mythologies, not just Greek, but uh, uh, ancient peoples all over the earth, they were terrified of Mars. That's fascinating. Um, who is the, the god of war for the Romans? Mars. Mm -hmm. um, most of the ancient were terrified of the planets, but especially Mars. Baal, he's a bad guy, right? A god, little g. His is another name for Mars. Named our days of the week after the planets. Did you know that? The days of the week are named for seven heavenly bodies. Um, sun, Day, that's easy. What comes after Sunday? Moon day. Two is day, that's the old English for Mars day. Two is is derived from the Sanskrit word divas, which, which is from the Romans. They derived their word deus or deity. March, the month of March, and all the, the uh, months are named after them as well, but March is named for? Mars, the Roman god of war and agriculture. The Greek god of war was called Ares, the Greek god of destruction and war, named after the planet Mars. Zeus hates Ares most. Why? Because he killed so many people. Mars was worshipped as Baal, Bel, or the calf, the Egyptian god little g, Apis, and sometimes even in India to this day. Odin's day, we know as Wednesday. That's Mercury's day. From the old English, Vodensdag. I don't know if that's pronounced correctly. <laughs> the day of Woden, the day of Mercury. Thor's day, okay? Freya day, that's named after Venus from the Latin dies Venaris. Or day of Venus. Is everybody okay? Anybody, anybody geeking out on this? I love this stuff. This is water to my soul. And then, of course, 
Saturn's day. Interesting, isn't it? Did you know that Rome was founded by Romulus? If you know the story and the tradition, about 750 BC. Most people don't know that Romulus founded the city soon after a horrible earthquake that was concurrent with the Joel Amos earthquake. The city, or the city that was the capital of this region, then was called Viscidium. It was the leading city. Rome said, Romulus, we're going to have to move it. And he moves it 15 miles up the Tiber, away from the harbor. Well, don't you want your major city near the harbor? Not at this time. Rome is today was started by using the rubble from the earthquake destroyed by Visidium. Romulus moves the city 15 miles up the Tiber. Why? Maybe because every hundred and eight years, there were severe tides and earthquakes. The next king of Rome adjusts the calendar after Romulus. Guess what date? 701 BC. He adds five days per the year. And of course, then Hezekiah as well. I want to tell you about another story in the Greek myth. It's the Greek of Phaethon. You know who Phaethon is? I got a slide for you. Are you ready? Go ahead. There's our boy Helios. Helium is named after him. No, I don't think so. But there's Helios. Now notice he's got his four uh, mighty steeds. Well, what is Helios' job? Helios puts the sun in his chariot, and it is Helios who is, whoosh, whoosh, yeah, it's Helios moving the sun across the sky. Okay. So that's why the sun moves. Well, Helios has a son, Phaethon. Phaethon in Greek mythology was the son of Helios, the sun god, and the nymph named Clymene. He persuaded his father, hey dad, can I have the car keys? The kids are still doing it today. He persuaded his father to let him drive the chariot of the sun across the sky. But Phaethon loses control of the horses and the, th the, uh, the myth is and the sun one day came too close to the surface of the earth and killed innumerable amount of people, scorched it horribly. To save the world from utter destruction, Zeus kills Phaethon with a thunderbolt. Go ahead, next slide. There he is. Can I drive the car, Dad? So there he is driving it across, but he's losing control. And here's a famous marble statue. Go ahead. That's him falling to the earth in a rather, rather dramatic fashion. But that's after he got wiped out by the lightning bolt, and he's, he's going to hit the earth. All right, hold it up there for just a second. Did you know that there are similar myths of the time that the sun, quote unquote, stood still or came too close to the earth? Long days are documented in other cultures like New Zealand. The Maori story of Maui is almost identical. Similar legends among American Indians, the phoenix bird of Egypt, the dragon stories of China, and even in Japanese lore. Well, there were three fellas who got to look in at these 108-year tremendous upheavals. And why was everybody freaked out about Mars? They wrote a book called The Long Day of Joshua and Six Other Catastrophes. I think it's out of print. Tough to get a hold of these days, but you might still find some online. Long Day of Joshua and Six Other Catastrophes by Donald W. Patton, Ronald R. Hatch, and Lauren C. Steinhauer. So... These, were, these guys noted that many ancient disasters were on this 108-year cycle. And it stopped in the year 701 B.C. In 2 Kings 20, Isaiah 38, the sundial, what, moves backwards by 10 degrees? Who are these guys? Mr. Ronald R. Hatch, who is Applied Physics Laboratory. He's a programmer. He worked for the Navy Navigational Satellite System. He was a senior engineer there. He worked in the space division of Boeing, and he was a software supervisor at Magnavox Research Laboratory. 
Uh, he has a huge brain, does Mr. Hatch. Lauren Steinhauer taught orbital mechanics at Harvard, MIT, and he was a mathematician at the Mathematical Sciences of Northwest. Yeah. And then um, they came up with an inter interesting idea. Now we know that Mercury and, and, and uh, Venus and then Mars and Earth and what have you, we have a certain cosmology that they have an orbit in, in successive distances from the sun. Did you know that the orbits of the planets are not entirely circular? They are elliptical. Uh, they know that from very precise measurements. So these 108 year sort of cycles got them to thinking. They put all their orbital stuff together and they wrote a book about it. They knew something called resonant orbits. In physics and also in electromagnetism, uh, I have a tuning fork tuned to 440, the note of A, boing, and I have another tuning fork uh, that is also 440. I don't touch this one, and this one is ringing, and whether it's either right next to it or across the back of the room, the unvibrating tuning fork will begin to vibrate because of resonance of the other tuning fork. You put a couple circuits too close together, just the right frequencies, they will exchange energy. And then in physics, because of how the motion of things work in Newtonian physics, resonance is a very real physics property. Planets interplay with one another and the sun by virtue of gravity. Resonant orbits is a relatively recent sort of study. Was ever Mars and Earth somehow close enough that when their one falls behind the other, it loses a little bit of its energy and the other one gains? They put a model together, and go ahead, Blake, and their model looks like this. They believe, according to this model, if this was true, notice the severe elliptical pattern, they believe that there was a resonant orbit, orbital setup between Mars and Earth. And based on their models and this 108 year sequence, they postulated that potentially Mars orbit was so elliptical that it actually went and ducked inside of Earth's orbit. And according to their model that fits these catastrophes, if this were so, what's called the perihelion, you see there, uh, that's when uh, Mars is closest to the sun. Um, they would cross each other every 108 years. They would literally, these two big old planets, Earth and Mars, would literally have a bit of a pass by every 108 years, and it would happen either in the fall or in March, Mars. Why did they name March after Mars? I want to show you some statistics about that. The effects, if this really happened according to the Hatch-Steinhauer model, that puts Mars passing within the Earth 100,000 miles. Is that close? Our sun, pardon me, our moon is 239,000 miles it would pass between us and the moon. If that were to happen, Mars to the naked eye would appear 50 times the size of a full moon. How freaky would that be? Now that's just if you're looking at it. Here's some other things that would happen. Crustal tides. Now you know what a tide of the ocean is. Here's our moon and here's the earth. Wherever the moon goes, the water on the surface of the earth bulges up to follow the moon. There's a, there's a tide. That's what tides are. Did you know that the crust of the earth actually has a bit of a tide as well? Currently, it's just a couple inches. But if something as large as Mars passed within 100 miles of the earth, what kind of tides would that be? You would have crustal tides of 20 feet. What happens to earthquake faults when you're pulling that kind of crustal tide? 
that would crack open or, or move uh, these plate tectonics in a severe fashion. Many ancient cities like Troy, Etruscan city of Visidium, which is Rome, Athens were rebuilt on their own rubble in 108 year increments. The potential magnetic field reversals. That's possible with a near pass by of Mars. Um, I couldn't help but think, but Isaiah chapter 24, verse 1. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it a waste and turneth it upside down. Oh, what a quaint notion. What if the earth's polarity did happen? Um, because of these two massive planets in such close proximity, their combined gravity would pull in all nearby meteors and bolides. If Mars, that massive planet, ever passed that close to the planet Earth, it would shift the axis, axes of the Earth several latitudes. Did you know the Earth is tilted 23 and a third degrees? That's why we have our seasons. Did you know that Mars is also tilted? Guess what the angle is? 24 degrees. If the Earth shifts just five degrees on its axis relative to the northern hemisphere, what would the sun then appear to do? Stand still or even move backwards. At five degrees, it would add four to six hours to a day. If shifted 23 and a third degrees in one time, that would add almost 20 to 24 hours. The sun would appear to stand still. Now, are you saying that's what happened? No, but isn't that interesting? Um, did you know that the planet Venus is upside down and rotating backwards? What? It's rotating backwards. All the, all the other planets in, the, in our solar system are spinning in the same direction, which you would expect from a Big Bang cosmology. How come one of the planets is spinning backwards? And as we said, Earth is in a very rough neighborhood. Um, where did the Kuiper belt and a bunch of other things happen? It's at least a possibility, and it is worked out on a uh, computer model, that if at one time Mars and Earth were in these severe elliptical orbits, that they could intersect and come within 100,000 miles of each other, and then in this model you reverse the film and you get to 701 BC, they came so close, their closest pass by yet, that resident orbits nudged Earth into its current orbit and Mars into its current orbit. Why in 701 BC or in front of that, all calendars, everybody say all, all calendars were 360 days, and after 701 BC, when the sundial appeared to move backwards, now all of our calendars are different. It's least a possibility that at one time, a near pass by every 108 years, the last one in 701 BC nudged both Earth and Mars into their current orbits. For your consideration. Interesting, huh? Let's go back now to the book of uh, Isaiah. I wanted to spend a little time with that because I enjoy uh, these kinds of exploits. It was Chuck Missler who first brought this to my attention. He has an extensive bibliography on the subject if you'd like to run this together. If you want the Hatch Steinhauer model and some of the books that they have written, it's a fascinating study. Um, who was the guy who wrote... Um, who wrote, um, oh, is it Eric Von Donegan? I can't think of the name, Chariots of the Gods and some of these others. Um, they also have done some research on some of the timing of these powerful destructive forces that happened on the same 108 year sort of frequencies. Uh, Eric Von Donegan, I think is who I'm thinking of. Um, is it called Worlds in Collision? I can't think of what it is. But at one time, uh, Earth was 360 days and Mar Mars was 720 days. Now there are their current designations. Anyway, possibility. 
Now, I am totally open to God gets to play with the, the physics of uh, Mars and the sun any way he wants to. Amen? Amen? But wouldn't it be something that if there was enough evidence on the earth, the historical records, that a model like this would potentially explain it? All right, back to Isaiah verse 9. Everybody okay uh, with your science? Cool. See, nobody died, Mike. We're all right. Science never hurt anybody, right? Verse number nine, back to chapter 38, verse number nine. This is the writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and had recovered from his sickness. I said, in the prime of my life, he's going to sing a song here for us. In the prime of my life, I, shall I go to, to the gates of Sheol? I am deprived of the remainder of my years. And here's what I said. I'm going to sing you a little song about it. I shall not see Yah, which is short for Yehovah or Jehovah, the Lord in the land of the living. He's effectively saying, yay, I'm not going to go to heaven just yet. I shall observe man no more among the inhabitants of the world. That is, should I enter the place of the dead when I'm in the prime of my life, robbed of the rest of my years? Verse 12, my lifespan is gone, taken from me like a shepherd's tent. I have cut off my life like a weaver. He cuts off from the loom. Oosh, you're done, pal. From day until night, you, have, you make an end of me. I have considered until morning. In other words, I was crying all night. I was torn up. But like a lion, in other words, I was ripped up like a lion. Like a lion, you know, when he breaks all of my bones. From day until night, you make an end of me. Like a crane or a swallow, so I chattered. I mourned like a dove. My eyes flail from looking upward. Oh, Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me. Help me, help me. This is blowing past God's stop sign. What did God say? Hezekiah, time to come home. What did Hezekiah do? <laughs> Please. Verse 15. What shall I say? He has both spoken to me and he himself has done it. I shall walk carefully, really humbly, all my years in the bitterness and the anguish of my soul. O oh Lord, by these things men live, and in all things is life of my spirit. He's basically saying, I was pretty bummed out, but I realized that your discipline and your plan, actually they're good. So you will restore me and make me live. Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness. In other words, it was really, really hard. But I know that tough times you use for good. So he's kind of writing some good truth here. But keep reading. But you have, longingly, you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption for you have cast all my sins by, behind your back. For Sheol, the grave, cannot thank you. Death cannot praise you. In other words, if I was dead, I couldn't be praising you right now, right? Isn't it a good thing you did, Lord, giving me 15 more years? Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. Only the living can. The living man. He shall praise you as I do this day, the Father shall make known your youth to the children. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing all my songs with stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. He's going to write a bunch of worship songs. He's going to put them on the radio and everybody's going to sing them. God is really good. He gave me 15 more years. He is awesome. Hezekiah is saying, I know God's way is better, and if I'm supposed to die, we'll praise God. But he chose to let me live. Wee! <laughs> I wrote my margin. I will spend all my life being grateful and praising you because you did this for me, Lord. I promise I will always be a really happy guy. Okay. Thought. Hezekiah is so appreciative, and he has such perspective perspective, quote unquote, he only gets 15 years. John Corson says, hey, we get eternity. I get why he's happy, but now, now watch this, verse 21. Now Isaiah had said, let them take a lump of figs and apply it as a poultice on the boil, and he shall recover. So whatever was 
messing him up must have been something of an infection of some kind uh, with entrance by this boil, you know. This is fascinating to me. I'm so sick I'm going to die. No, you're not. Didn't God just stop the sun relative to where he is? That's a pretty big miracle. Yet he effectively says to, to Hezekiah, take two aspirin and call me in the morning. What? Fascinating. God has just used a huge miracle to blow everybody away, the miracle of the sundial. But here, he's using a typical medicinal method to heal. John Corson says, miracles don't heal people. Medicine and doctors don't heal people. God does. I mean, God has used miracles and God uses medicines and doctors all the time. But we all are familiar with stories of uh, some procedure that should have been routine and somebody passes away. This is a fascinating study here. God practically held the sun still, or perhaps using this model, I don't know, but the point of it is extraordinary. And yet when it comes to him um, saving his life, uh, take two aspirin and call me in the morning. God knows the who and the why he will heal and the who and the why that he will not. All believers will be healed. That's true. By his stripes we are healed. Some of us on this side of glory and the rest of us on the other. Now watch this. Verse 22. Hezekiah said, Wow, Lord, you're awesome. And forgive me about that little tent or my through. <laughs> really, Lord, it really is your will, not mine. Nope. Look what Hezekiah does. Hezekiah said, he's just watched the sun move backwards. He has just seen or will see soon uh, that awful Sennacherib, one angel of the Lord, is going to go through and kill 185,000 Assyrians here in just a minute. And he's just been raised practically from the dead. Hezekiah's response, verse 22. What is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? Uh, you got another sign for me? I wrote my margin. Seriously? Dude, the, sending, the sun standing still thing not good enough? After you wrote this awesome song of faith? Hezekiah, dude, what are you doing? When I am not, not my will but thine be done, then this Hezekiah is me. What do you mean? Didn't Isaiah, the word of God, come to Hezekiah and says, God is going to heal you? Yes. And after the sundial and everything, eh, God, word of God is cool, but you got anything more? Would you stand with me? Oh, Lord, Hezekiah, what a goof. <laughs> what a maroon. You know, we look at a guy like that, Lord, and we say, oh, I would never do that. And Lord, come to find out, I am very capable of doing the same sort of thing. What if Isaiah came up to me? Well, he has in the 66 chapters that we are reading. God's word, modeled by prophets in the Old Testament, God's word is every bit the same authority and power as when they were being breathed by the prophets themselves. And how many times have I read your Bible that said, Steve, don't go there and don't do that. And something in me says, well, yeah. Is there anything else, Lord? How about you send me a sign? Yeah. How about I see an angel? Then I believe. Harvest is a rule Though God will at times use supernatural signs, his best methodology is hide his word in your heart that you don't sin. Lord, I pray for myself as well as all of us here tonight, Lord. Looks pretty silly on old Hezekiah whining and crying like a sparrow and a bird. Please, God, please, <laughs> please, God. And he prayed right through God's stop sign. 
And the number of catastrophes were the result. And even with his 15 extra years, a walking miracle. Lord, you got anything else? Anything more? Lord, I thank you for worship and praise because it does allow our hearts to soar. Many of the times, Lord, my emotions have dragged in well behind my belief. Many of the times, Lord, that it's been a rough and difficult season and your felt manifested presence has been wonderful, uplifting. But Lord, as of these last couple of years, you've been calling this shepherd to walk not by what he sees, not to have my head turned by a number of models of ministry, even in our own city. I want to thank you, Lord, you've called this pastor to break it down to its most simple element. Teach your word verse by verse. Worship you in spirit and in truth. And that's all. For this current season, Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that I have been trying my very best to walk not by sight, but by faith. And when I have a number of strong <laughs> encouragements to do otherwise, I want to thank you, Lord, for the example of Hezekiah. I don't want to be that guy, Lord. Is there anything else? You got another experience for me, Pastor Steve? How about another program? Well, yeah, you know, Wednesday night and Tuesday night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what else you got around here? I want to thank you, Lord, that a number of people have, have witnessed, Lord, as they stand on your word alone, what they have walked through in the challenging season of COVID that so many, Lord, have come through stronger. We've been saying it for years. If there was no church building and programs, would you still grow in the things of God? What artificial spiritual life support systems have I been relying too heavily upon? Who have I been looking for to stick my IV tube into? We've been trying to learn to feed ourselves, Lord. I believe that served many quite well through the COVID season. And Lord, I don't know what's coming up next, but I pray that you find faith here at Harvest Family Fellowship. And I pray, Father, that you're teaching us to stand firmly on your word. Not my will, Lord, but yours. Whether you want to move the sun or just say, just take two aspirin. I will believe you, Lord, and I will follow. In Jesus' name and all the faithful, the Lord said, amen. Amen, amen. 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 See you on Sunday, everybody.